being here, really thrilled that we have this beautiful weather to gather on this wonderful day here at Weeksville Heritage Center, a very important and incredibly special place. I have the distinct pleasure to again welcome you all and to also just share with you all just a bit about Museum Hue. So I am the Executive Director of Museum Hue. My name is Stephanie Johnson Cunningham and we have been around since 2015 for almost 10 years now, really looking at the need for greater equity, starting within the museum field and expanding it to the greater arts field and thinking critically about racial equity very specifically. And throughout the pandemic, we had the opportunity to do a Hue Arts initiative, and this is where the Building Hue Spaces uh, program came out of. So Hue Arts NYC was an initiative where we created a map directory and a report that specifically looks at uh, black, indigenous, uh, Asian, Latinx, and all POC arts entities throughout the city thinking about the work that they do and also uh, the greater need for support and um, financial equity within the field as well. And so Building Hue Spaces uh, in partnership with American Institute of Architect really came out of a need for thinking critically about the spaces in which we occupy as it relates to arts and culture. And so we're really excited to be here at Weeksville. We had four conversations starting at the Center for Architecture um, in January and then going to spaces like the Clemente Center, El Barrio Art Space, and now again Weeksville to have this kind of um, convening that really speaks about <clears throat> the preservation of black spaces in different boroughs, starting with Brooklyn, but we'll hear from people who are doing really incredible work all throughout uh, New York City. And before I hand it over to Dr. Codrington, I um, just wanted to do a bit of a land acknowledgement as well, really quickly. Yes, so as we discuss building spaces for organizations of color, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are building on lands stewarded and built by marginalized com communities. Museum Hue operates on the ancestral and occupied lands of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie peoples. We acknowledge that many parts of what we now know as Manhattan and Brooklyn were built through violence and human labor from not only indigenous communities, but also enslaved Africans. We not only acknowledge the harm caused here, but work actively to be a part of a more just and equitable society. So again, thank you all for being here with us, and I will pass it over to Dr. Codrington, Executive Director of Weeksville. Greetings, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to Weeksville. Uh, my name is Dr. Raymond Codrington, and I'm the President and CEO of Weeksville Heritage Center. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees, supporters, and staff, I'd like to welcome you to Weeksville. Our mission is, well, we're a historic site as well as a cultural institution, and our mission is using uses arts, education, and social justice to preserve and document and engage people around the history of Weeksville. We've been looking forward to this event for a while. Um, it brings together many colleagues, partisan collaborators, both past and present. Um, I was in the lobby, came across, where's Jennifer, Jennifer Scott? In, in the back. Um, we actually worked here for 10 years. Um, thank you for your contribution. We have the architects that designed the building, uh, Sarah Caples and Everardo Jefferson. We have Elizabeth Kennedy, a landscape architect. So this is uh, definitely like, you know, Peaches and Herb definitely feeling reunited <laughs> and it feels good. And, um, you know, it, it's, it really speaks to the ways in which all these different sort of forces entities, creative energy have come together to create a very unique experience for, for Weeksville. And I want to thank Stephanie Cunningham, Stephanie Johnson Cunningham, and um, Museum Hue team for holding this event at Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, Museum, Hue's, Museum Hue's work really speaks for itself and is definitely making an impact in reframing the conversation around the significance of arts and culture but also illuminating some of the structural barriers that impede access to growth and resources, especially for communities of color. So thank you for your work and thank you for holding the event at Weeksville. So before the program starts, I want us to become a little bit more grounded in the space. 
Um, when you come to Weeksville, you get a 360 degree view of Weeksville from its beginnings in 1838 to, to now. So on, on, this side of the, on this side of the site, you have this building, which is well, opened in 2014. And on the other side, and the, the architects, I'm sure, will have a lot to say about the building and the significance and what it means. And they just had a great book come out. And I was just reading through it this morning. It was just amazing. So hopefully you'll, you'll touch on some of that. And on this side, you have the Hunterfly Road houses, which are from the mid-1800s. And collectively, and then you have this beautiful green space that ties it all together. So collectively, I feel like that is the Weeksville experience from sort of start to, to our present. But in a broader sense, I think of Weeksville as not only buildings and landscape, but also a set of ideas as well as being a place. It was established based on the radical question around what happens when black people explore freedom in the face of virulent racism. So Weeksville was a racial equity and social justice project that was ahead of its time. And it really is a story of triumph because the founders of Weeksville created a history in a community that can't and won't be denied still with us. We began as a free black community in 1838, 11 years after the abolition of slavery in New York State. At that time, if you're a black male, unfortunately only male, with property valued above $250, you had the right to vote and enjoy a version of full citizenship. And the community celebrated ideas, ideals of self-determination, freedom, economic empowerment, mutual aid, and pride in being black. Weeksville, historic Weeksville had institutions, the Howard Orphan Asylum, the Zion Home for the Aged, Colored School Number Two, a newspaper called the Freedmen's Torchlight, even a baseball team called the Unknowns. But essentially at its core, it was, a ba it was an oasis and a safe space for black people and black, black thought. But at the core of Weeksville's um, existence is a focus on community. At every stage of, of historic Weeksville's history from its founding to becoming part of the Cultural Institutions Group four years ago, community support has been central to our existence. With that said, the question around how arts and culture, cultural organizations preserve and sustain the legacy of community is one of, is one of the question or a question that we engage with every day or a set of issues that we engage every day. We do this by amplifying our history while thinking about the present and future of the organization and the community in which we're embedded. But what makes this a tangible project, or a more tangible project, or tangible in different ways, is that we have the Hunterfly Roadhouses on one side in the building and this building on the other. And we were able to move, I think, fairly effortlessly between the historical and the contemporary through what I feel like are, are, are portals. So this bridge right here that you see that takes you to the houses, as well as that footbridge. So I don't know, it's, I know the sort of the landscape and the building architects, I don't know how you were cut from the same cloth, I don't know how you did it, but you created definitely a unique experience. And this has really allowed us to tell our story and our history, represent our history much more vividly in, in very tangible ways. So with that being said, um, once again, I'd like to welcome you to Weeksville. The conversation, I'm sure, will be rich. The, the, everybody involved is extremely brilliant. I think it's both a, a, an honor and a privilege to have both the speakers and all audience members here. Hopefully you walk away with a deeper and richer sense of really what Weeksville is, but really what it took, what it takes to get us to where we are now. And I'm very excited about the conversation. So once again, on behalf of everybody here at Weeksville, welcome. And I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Kajinson, and for hosting us here at Weeksville. Sure. Um, how many people, this is your first time here at Weeksville? Can we have a show of hands? Wow, good, good, welcome. Almost, almost half of the room, very good. So thank you all again for joining us. I also want to give a shout out to our funders as well. Thank you to the Ford Foundation for making today possible. Again, to the American Institute of Architects and our partners there, Karai and Peter. And also again, thank you to the Hugh Arts NYC community and the Museum Hugh team who made this all possible. And again, if you all have the time, please check out the map directory and report that speaks very specifically about institutions like Weeksville and others and the incredible work that they do all throughout New York City. So we were able to identify over 400 uh, black, indigenous, Latinx, and Asian arts entities across the five boroughs. And we really encourage you to check it out and also read the report that speaks very specifically around the racial inequity that they face throughout the city. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce 
um, Commissioner Everardo Jefferson, who was also the principal architect for this incredible space. Um, it is exciting to have you here with us. We've been in conversation for some time, but again, Everardo Jefferson is a principal architect and co-founder of Caples Jefferson Architects. His most recent book with Sarah Caples, his wife, is Many Voices, Architecture for Social Equity. Caples Jefferson's social equity work has gained national recognition in the US <clears throat> and has been published internationally for its exceptional design qualities. Among its most notable projects are Heritage Health and Housing Social Services Agency, located in a farmer garage in Harlem, Queens Theater in the park, expanding a World Fair building into a public theater, and Weeksville, a new visitor's building and campus built around a rediscovered Freedmen's Preservation Site. Their new museum building, complementing Louis Armstrong's house in Corona, New York, will open this summer. Everardo is a practicing architect who has worked on social equity projects for over 30 years. Everardo's community service has included serving on the boards of social justice and educational institutions, and he is currently acting as a commissioner of the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission. Everardo frequently teaches as a guest educator in schools of architecture, most recently as Davenport professor at Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Jefferson. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So Sarah and I would do this uh, conversation. My big job is slide assistant today. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Building Hue Spaces for their kind invitation to give a brief speech. And I also want to thank them for holding this important meeting at Weeksville Heritage Center. Weeksville <laughs> and I are old friends. Being through a lot together, we both know each other. Yeah. We both know each other, and we, every time we see each other, we kind of give a gentle Japanese bow and in acknowledgement of our time together. Our team has been very proud that Weeksville is part of the New York Cultural Institutional Group, CIG. Now, I don't know if you know what that means or what it means in terms of the city, but Weeksville is one of 34 members of the CIG group. That's citywide, and it's and one of only six members in the borough of Brooklyn, which are, the six members are Brooklyn Academy of Music, next. Next, the Brooklyn Museum, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, Brooklyn Children's Museum, Wildlife Conservancy Society of New York Aquarium, next, and Weeksville. Weeksville is in really good company. Ah, I'm getting confused here. Okay, okay. I want to give a brief talk on two subjects. The first, what is Weeksville? And the second, what are landmarks in New York City and what they mean? Both of these questions are answered on a personal level, not in any academic way, but just purely personal, and what I think about them. 
Let's start with Weeksville. I don't want to talk too much about the history of Weeksville, we know that, or the trials and tribulations of the community in getting this thing built. I don't want to talk about that either. I want to talk, however, on the original intent or concept of the project and how it's changed over time. Weeksville was completed in 2013. I heard 2014 today, but it's 2013, I think, on the sub. That's 10 years ago. The design elements of Weeksville are four elements. The historic building, the new building, the fence, and the dominant piece of Weeksville is the garden. The garden is what holds everything together in Weeksville, ties it together. And what it does in a kind of actual and metaphoric way, it takes you from the present to the past and back again. And it takes you the, through that sequence through an ever-changing garden. It changes all the time. It'll be changing for another hundred years. So this, this, this journey back and forth is an important part of the architectural concept, thanks to her. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, where am I, please? And then this interesting observation that happen, happens over time. So, Weeksville, the original building, the new building, had this beautiful brown wood color. And over time, it has changed. It has grayed down. And what has happened in terms of the composition of Weeksville is that at the beginning, the new building was dominant. People looked at the new building. They said, wow, great, all that stuff. The historic buildings were subordinate. They were subordinate structure. Over time, things have shifted. The new building has quieted down, and the principal, the most important part of the complex is those historic buildings. And now they're alive again. They're the center of the attraction. Another thing that happened here that I did not anticipate was creating a sense of place. Weeksville has become, has developed a, 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 a personality of its own, a quality of its own, and, and, and I felt it more at dusk or in early evenings, and, uh, but it has this quality that all wonderful places develop a sense of place. Weeksville is not only a community facility, it's a city facility. That means that Weeksville will be around for a long time. It is the task of a new generation of leaders, <coughs> excuse me, to continue the legacy and the inspiration embedded in this place. Let's talk about landmarks, which is, uh, as defined by the New York City, Landmark Preservation Commission. What does it mean when a building is given landmark status? It means your building has a special, historical, cultural, or aesthetic value to the city, state, or nation. It is an important part of a city's heritage. And the, and the LPC must approve in advance any alteration reconstruction, demolition, or new construction affecting the design of buildings. So that's the definition, the legal definition. Now let me talk about what, what I find important about landmarks, and it, it might be a bit strange. Landmarks are urban markers, as I see them, three-dimensional structures in the environment that acts as signs, 
that illustrate a particular time and place and conjure up, at least in my mind, the human condition surrounding that place, how people lived, walked, talked. So I imagine the humanity there. And I can imagine living, working, and enjoying life at some of these markers. So let's look at some of these markers. Uh, too many pages. So I'm going to start off with I'm going to start off with, with the ones everybody knows, the big ones, the large ones, you know, the Chrysler building, flat iron building. It's a beautiful structure, lovely. Flat iron building, the Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. And then we go to smaller ones in outer boroughs, the Lewis Paradise Theater. Next, Congregational Church in the Bronx. And Edgar Allen's Post Cottage in the Bronx. Now, here's one of my my favorites, and let me see if I can put it in a way that why it's so important to me. It's former colored school number four. And it's, uh, next slide. That's the location in, in it's located at um, 128 West 17th Street in Manhattan. This is a view of it bird's eye view of it, surrounded by new construction. The building was constructed by the New York City Public School Society in 1849 to 1850. In 1853, the building was transferred to the New York City, to, to New York City when the Board of Education was established. The school became colored school number seven in 1860. Civil War time. Became colored school number four in 1866, just after the Civil War. At that time, there were only 88 primary schools in Manhattan that served 2,377 African American students. In 1884, the school became grammar school number 81. And at that time, in 1884, they dropped the name Colored. But despite the name change, Grammar School Number 81 continued to serve African American children exclusively until 1894. And that's the building. A simple, you, you would miss it if you passed by it. You couldn't even see it. But if you imagine, you see there are two entrances. There's an entrance for women and an entrance for men and a front door. And you can imagine all those students in this three-story buildings for such a long time. I, I find it a powerful statement about preservation and what it means in, in a small sense and in, in a certain context. Uh, as an immigrant boy, whose experience in New York City was going to public schools, I had no idea that stuff like this existed. Landmarks that helped me bring, landmarks helped me to bring into that present and tie me back to my present. Thank you all. again, Commissioner Jefferson, um, and thank you so much for the incredible work that you've done for the city of New York, including Weeksville. And again, it is really exciting to see us all gathered in the space that you've and uh, Capel's Jefferson firm helped to create. 
as you also mentioned, the garden of this space is what holds us together. And so it's really exciting to have landscape architect Elizabeth Kennedy, who designed the garden and the landscape of this space, as well as Kenyatta McLean, co-managing director for Black Space, join us today. So before I ask them to come up, I'll just briefly read their short bios. So Kenyatta McLean is an urban planner and strategist interested in neighborhood resource distribution and heritage conservation. She's the co-manager of Black Space and a founding member. She works with organizations to deepen their understanding of spatial narratives with curated conversations and to develop projects centered in racial justice. As an economic development practitioner, she developed strategies, engagement plans, and commercial corridor focused programming for multiple city-led neighborhoods plans in New York City. Additionally, she advised and managed multiple commercial revitalization grants for nonprofits focused on low to moderate income commercial corridors across New York City. Kenyatta earned her BA in Afro-American Studies and Political Science from UCLA. She holds an MA in City Planning from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she researched the power of narrative within historic preservation. One of her favorite black spaces is a good beauty supply store. As someone who enjoys new hairstyles, beauty supply stores are like her own arts and craft stories. Elizabeth Kennedy, as I mentioned, is the founder of Elizabeth Kennedy Landscape Architect, black owned and woman run. EKLA is the longest surviving such firm in the country. Its longevity is intrinsically tied to Elizabeth's tenacity and her belief in the importance of service to clients, to the community, the emerging professionals she trains, the profession and the process of design. The work she directs quietly challenges mainstream assumptions about the aspirations and needs of underrepresented voices. Systems and biases have long disposed the less powerful of spaces and rendered the people who use them invisible. Elizabeth is best known for work that counters this invisibility. Her projects at the intersection of social justice and design exemplify landscape architecture's potential to engage a broader critical understanding of place and identity. It's from this perspective and standpoint that Elizabeth teaches direct critiques, frames, collaborates, and edits, whether in her studio or through national debate. Please join me in welcoming them both. And so this conversation today we titled Black Women Building, and it's like a double entendre, talking about physical building space, but all that black women has built as it relates to community, as it relates to preservation, as it relates to the future. And so this will be a conversation between Kenyatta and Elizabeth, and we're just looking forward to hearing their wisdom and brilliance. Thank you. share about things that come to us around preservation, whether they're sites that we've helped in preservation or design, or preservation sites that we've designed um, or done research around. So that's the visuals that are happening in the back. <laughs> um, to start the conversation, we started a conversation last week, so we can kind of keep going on that. Right. We're here to talk about women built and how we as women practitioners 
um, have actually built on the legacy of women who have preceded us. Mm -hmm. How women in particular have been deeply involved in the preservation of, of black and brown spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, compounding sort of the issue where underrepresented voices are championed by underrepresented voices. And how, um, at least on, in, from my perspective, uh, the social reckon, reckoning of the past two years has sort of broadened the opportunity for these voices now to be heard mm -hmm. and what it would take to actually create um, the listening space that we can actually hear what the people are saying. Yeah, and I think when we talk, started having this conversation, a piece of it um, that was really important to us is talking about um, black autonomy and sustainability and what that looks like in a preservation space, especially in a field that, if we look at its um, historic beginnings, uh, was very focused around preserving ideas of white supremacy and, uh, and preserving Confederate statues, like, you know, some sore losers, um, really are who started this field of preservation. Um, and so then what does it look like for black people to um, kind of participate in that? And we've talked about, we talked a little bit about what material, like having the ability to have tangible spaces and being able to own your material items, that's not something that's always been promised to black communities and black people. And so um, the field of preservation has not always supported our um, existence and culture being able to be um, held in history and, and also like brought into the future uh, because so much of our work sometimes does force us into an intangible space, um, and that's not really recognized uh, through preservation, sometimes policies, uh, funding, and like different laws. And so that was something that we also kind of started to talk about while we are very excited for all of these black spaces, such as Weeksville, that we can physically touch and experience. Um, there is so much of black culture that's had to be like in a knapsack a little bit and be able to you know move from site to site, and what does that mean, and how do we, um, I think a question that I think about is like how we make connection points from spaces like um, Weeksville, where we have a physical land space, to, um, I think I was just talking to someone named Larry with this Fulton Art Fair, um, and that is a space that, it's um, an art fair that's popping up on Fulton for now, like almost 65 years. Um, what does it look like to kind of make connections between those, um, those more uh, uh, non, um, physically located spaces um, and those that are? It's something that's like really exciting to me. Um, and some of the work that I've, done has been around the Brownsville Heritage House um, in, in Brownsville, which this that space is you know 43 years old and has um, been able to be a space of artifact and keeping, led and created by Mother Rosetta Gaston and then led by a army of black women, um, uh, really just building a community archive over these past uh, 40 some odd years. So what does it look like to bring that out onto the sidewalk for Brownsville? Um, residents and younger um, students to, or younger people to experience um, are things that kind of I've been in conversation with um, Miriam Robertson, the executive director of that space. Okay. Well, my, I guess, way of describing um, working in this space and being in this space is a, 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 little, a little different. Um, it goes to Everardo's comment about the personal aspect of actually the immersion in the work. Um, I, well, Everardo said that, you know, he's been involved with Weeksville for a long time. I've been involved with Weeksville even longer. Um, the in 1998 was when I first started on this project. Um, but to step back a little earlier, um, and there are lots of anecdotes there that, that could be shared maybe at another time, uh, very early when I started the practice, Sarah and I met Sarah and Everardo, and they, they said, why don't you come to the office and show us your work, right? And this is, this is back when I was doing everything by hand, so I went through the hand drawing. And I rolled out some stuff, and, and I, think, I think we had started to work on something together, and uh, they were very nice about hiding their disappointment because landscape, arch <laughs> <laughs> landscape architects um, in, in New York in particular, in New York City, um, our work comes through teams. I, I like to say to my office that we need dates to the dance. Mm -hmm. And so a large part of, of establishing relationships is trying to figure out what, what you know, the, the people who've invited you, the prime consultant actually wants or is expected. And so I, I rolled out this drawing, and then you know Sarah said just very gently, "What would you? What would you really? What do you really want to do?" 
And I said, well, you know, you know, in that case, I would do this. And she said, well, go ahead and do that. I share this, this anecdote really badly because it actually liberated me. Mm -hmm. That was the turning point for my practice. And that allowed me to bring my whole self. And, and you know, when we talk about women practices, we really talk about um, the ability to bring our whole selves to, to the work that we're doing. And it allowed me to bring my whole self, including my experience, as a child of immigrants, as somebody who actually grew up not far from here, whose parents remembered the Hunter Fly Road houses, um, to choosing a practice, you know, an area of practice that nobody really knows about, to be able to do all of these things. But when they invited me to participate in Weeksville, and actually I was continuing the relationship with Weeksville, um, it was continuing the aspect of the, the and becoming really immersed in the narratives and the stories and the, I would say, the political activism and the strategies that Joan Maynard was doing to, to make this project happen. So I go back all the way to those, to those days. And there were people that I met who preceded me. So there's a, a long institutional memory. And institutional memory is very important because when we're talking about historic preservation, when we're talking about the continuity that Everardo described and the experience of this landscape, but really the continuity of community, you know, with the work that Kenyatta is doing, the work that we do, whether or not we articulate it formally or not, it's about ensuring that there is continuity of story and the connection to place. Now, as a landscape architect, we actually are looking at different elements of the design. And what I loved about working with Cable Jefferson in particular was that there were sensibilities that we shared. People talk to me, they come to me and talk to me about landscaping, and I said, wait, 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 you know. Are you talking about planting design or are you talking about landscape design? And a lot of times they're usually talking about planting design. But for us, the issue is the topography, the relationship of of an individual's experience of connection to a place based on the experience of the land itself. And in New York, that's kind of tough because we, we have this sort of hardened um, impression of what land is. But if we allow ourselves to step back and sort of broaden that, that definition, then in doing preservation work, we're looking at the basis of connection to place and the basis of connection to land. And so the things that the Landmarks Preservation Commission looks at, like the quality of light, the availability of space, the historic sense of proportion that was in the space, even in, in the face of change, is something that very much went on here. And in terms of our work, in terms of our work with communities, even to activate the spaces that we've designed or others have designed, we're still looking at those sort of basic elements that, that attest to the connection of place. What do you think about so connection of place and then um, um, connection to what do you think about connection to time, like when we think about preservation for different communities? Because I, I feel like there's like um, our experience of space and place um, can be very much connected to our different identities, but also our experience of time and whether or not mm, you're seen. I, this connects to one of my photos of like um, Alicia Wormsley's work of there are black people in the future, those billboards that she put um, everywhere. This one's one that she placed in Detroit. I think it was curated by Ingrid LaFleur. Um, but this idea that black people are in the future, I feel like preservation work has so much to do around that because you can't imagine, and it's very difficult to imagine yourself at all when you're not being affirmed of your existence. Mm -hmm. And so there's like Weeksville being here like affirms black youth and black people that we've been here, that we've built here, that we owned here, that we also planned here and sustained community here, despite what sometimes the present might, um, the present might uh, distract us from that knowing, right? And like um, make us feel as if that can't happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts around like time. how time um, is impacted by this? Well, in terms of this conversation, to me that immediately goes to the recognition and ability to acknowledge stakeholding, you know, how people have 
some sense of equity and claim in, in a location, in a space, in, in the events that happened here. And so a lot of times, as we know, stakeholding has not been recognized. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get recognizing when it's, when it's a, a formal exercise to recognize stakeholding. But that, again, goes to the future of stakeholding present of stakeholding, the, the past, the, the history of stakeholding, and the forms in which it manifested itself, and, and whether or not these, these forms were um, clear, the, pattern, the patterns of, the patterns of, 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 of I'm going to say patterns of equity were, were clear, or, or they were sort of obscure, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and what, how is that sustained in, in terms of, um, in our industry, in terms of place? This is sort of the, the question. Yeah. yeah. I, so um, to this like kind of sustainability point, I think we were talking, I'm trying to remember some points that, um, in that earlier conversation. We talked around um, thinking about uh, sustainability and also autonomy and what's the importance of who's leading projects also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, we have so many. There's so much rich black history across the globe, but particularly we can talk about in the U.S. Um, and then when we think about who are who has access to it, even the idea or the fact that your um, firm is like alone in the fact that it is, you know, a black woman-owned landscape architect firm. That is in 2023. That's really. Um, it's, it's a stark like uh, reality that we're not able to kind of curate and imagine and to the point that you were saying around when you were liberated, when Sarah says to you, mm -hmm. what do you actually want? People don't ask black women that, right? In terms of the preservation of our spaces. And so there's something around that um, sustainability that also has to do with us being able to continue to get more um, uh, curation leadership spaces mm -hmm. um, available to us and not being I think there was something you mentioned in your, your first like line of comments around uh, um, the you know under-resourced folks sometimes or marginalized folks being like their stories being told by those that are not right and what does that like how how does that disrupt um, the liberation of someone that's you know trying to be a, do preservation of work? Well, I, I I think one of one of the opportunities that a project like Weeksville. Um, um, we're working with Bowery Residence Committee on a project where um, there is actually archaeological archaeological overlays of history of one seed Lenape and enslaved Africans mm. on one site, mm. and how that how that space and the, the, the entire space, including an interior, is smaller than this room. So you can imagine it's it's, it's very dense in terms of the story. Um, it shouldn't be ignored the granular level at which you have to understand storytelling or, or, or evidence that, that the, the level, the, 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 you know, when, when, um, it, when the same, you know, God is in the details, this, mm -hmm. is, this is really very, very much the case that, that the nuances that distinguish one situation from another, or one one culture from another, or one neighborhood from another, right, are sort of perceived and understood. And you understand who championed those those nuances. And a lot of times it it has been women because because in Western traditions, it traditionally women women are focused on the details, right? <laughs> you know, you know, in, in in terms of a lot of things having to do with community. So the, because women are also focused on the logistics of community, and I think that that's an important sort of point to make, mm -hmm. that in those stories you begin to see how power is negotiated, how elements are, are um, secured. Mm -hmm. So for instance, at this site, when we were starting, uh, in order to engage the community here, uh, Joan was, men, was one of many um, sort of local preservationists who responded to um, instances of uh, neighborhood violence by planting trees within 
that landscape took knowledge of the lives of young people who had been lost to gun violence. Mm -hmm. They were all here in, in Weeksville. And I remember the kickoff meeting during construction because our plan had called to preserve all of them. And the contractor said, well, you know, it, it's more convenient for me to just cut down all of those trees and then replace them later. And everybody was comfortable with that except me. <laughs> and it wasn't just that I'd stayed up to draw the boxes, you know, the preservation, tree preservation boxes, but it was the fact that the, the story wasn't understood. And it made me realize that, and even, you know, to be honest, at the executive directorship level of Weeksville at that time, that the story, it, it wasn't resonant. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, okay, how are we going to negotiate that loss? But also, what do we have to do as an industry to make sure that these stories are part of the contract negotiations, are part of the way we, we expect Contractors, for instance, who claim to have a certain level of expertise come understanding these nuances. I think this is a much broader um, responsibility in the profession yes. um, that we have to have. So that the conversations that we're having in the areas of work that we're focusing on actually have um, a sustained support, you know, because there's a pipeline or there's a chain of, of thinking sort of sort of like a philosophical sort of perspective on what has to happen in these projects. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the okie doke, you know, like business right. as usual. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question. No, I, I think, well, <laughs> I'm interested in what you said. So now um, that kind of brings me to kind of share about like my own liberation of when did I start thinking about planning differently. And a piece of that as 2015 is a good year, like Museum View starts, um, this is the beginnings of Black Space, um, which is a collective that I'm a part of and have been a co-founder of. And we met each other at Black in Design. A lot of us ended up meeting each other at Black in Design, hosted by a group of African American grad students at the GSD, um, who decided that they wanted to talk about Black people and Black design, Black-led design projects, and how Black folks have impacted the design field and also been impacted by design and planning. And so we had this wonderful conversation over two days. And then all of us were, you know, a lot of us were at that time working in um, white-led spaces, you know, whether that was in private or um, uh, public offices in design, planning, architecture. Um, and we were like, wow, we are um, so dehydrated of these conversations. Like, we don't get to talk about what does it mean to center blackness in your work and think about the importance of why the tree must stay and that we shouldn't cut down a tree um, that was replaced someone's life and it's res um, respecting and putting homage to someone's life um, because we don't understand that nuance, right? And so we were often those that one person in the room that wasn't comfortable with something being said around a project. So we found each other um, and then we're able to come back. A lot of us lived in Brooklyn. We came back to that um, and started hosting brunches at each other's on each other's couches to talk about and critique the different fields that we're working in. And that's how we got to this manifesto and these 14 design principles. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about of like, how do we start to recenter ourselves? Um, so we're not, um, I think you framed it as like the okie doke, like we don't want to just keep doing, re keep re um, uh, repeating or um, uh, creating the same narratives. And so we started to say, okay, what are actual principles that we want to practice? And so things like centering the lived experience came up for us of like, that is something when I'm doing a planning project, I'm going to make the forefront. Um, for other folks that are doing architecture projects, there's something we talked about moving at the speed of trust. Um, and what does that mean? Because in our projects, the, the speed of trust is the last thing anyone's was thinking about. Um, you know, often people were thinking about uh, milestones, uh, you're thinking about milestones, you're thinking about client deadlines, and you're thinking about, you know, when are the pay, the pay periods, um, you know, that, and deliverables we need to do for those pay periods. But building trust with a community, and I still, I'll keep going back to this tree example that you, beautiful tree example you gave us, of the, the feelings that you had around like, mm, this doesn't seem right, like, it feels like we should keep the trees. Um, that's like a moment, those are uh, metrics of trust that you're building with folks that lost. And you're respecting that their folks are supposed to continue, there's not supposed to be a gap in the memorial of their loved ones. Um, because the contractor that insinuates the idea of cutting down and replacing the trees, that's taking away that time 
from those folks. And the stealing of time is something that people have been doing for black people for too long. That's a whole other conversation. And so I'll leave that alone. But that's this, for myself, I think, getting to be in a space very private, personal, because I think you brought this up of like how much of this work is personal. Being in those personal home spaces with each other and building a manifesto of 14 design principles that is how we center our work and how we work with each other was something that really liberated me. Because then I have, and then once we started sharing that with people, even for those of us that were still working with city government or, pub, or private um, firms at that time, we now, it was us plus this poster. I got this clear manifesto, this is what I'm orienting myself. Do not be in meetings with me confused about where I come from like and what I'm standing for. And I feel like that articulation was a thing that helped liberate me. Yeah. 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 I think you touched on something that, um, I don't know where this is going to go, <laughs> this conversation or in the broader sense, but the pace at which work is being done in the industry right now, I mm -hmm. think works against us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you also work on, you know, we, we, we are on projects where everybody, there's a kickoff meeting mm -hmm. and then we've actually had this happen when people say, well, what are you doing with the landscape? And I said, well, what are you doing with the building? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, and they said, well, we haven't decided where the front door is yet. And I said, well, I can't get you there. You know, so I don't understand why we're having this conversation. But there's a schedule that says that yes. we have a checkup on these times. The whole aspect of the, of the collaborative discussion, the whole pace that the project demands, I think is something that we have to start to look at to yeah. make sure. I had the luxury of being on this project for more than two decades. So much so that when I went to work on another project and they said, what do you mean? Uh, you know, 100% CDs in nine months. I, you know, I had no context for that, and that, that, was, that was a wake-up call. But we were able to <coughs> delve into all aspects of this project. And the Weeksville is, is magical for a lot of reasons. Part of it is because it had its own geographic integrity. The houses were where they were built, the Hunterfly Road, you know, you know, came, it, it crossed the site in pretty much the way it did 150, 200 years ago. So all of these things could be there and they were respected. A lot of our spaces don't have any of this, of, of, the, of this physical evidence anymore, or the, you know, the traditional ideas of physical evidence. And we were talking in that conversation, and you know, as it continues, about how design responds to the intangible. And we have that from a historical standpoint. We also have that from an engagement standpoint. You know, well, you know community engagement. So, you know, what are we talking about? You know, lots of post-its and it's like, you know, are we having a substantive conversation here because we haven't designed it to be to be substantive? So there's a whole, I think, broadening and different perspective that's very exciting, quite frankly, and you know, is rich in content an opportunity, but I think that, you know, the effort to rethink practice and your generation, because we had a generational conversation too, your generation is also pushing that idea that it's time to rethink practice, not yes. simply just, just in terms of what's represented or what the opportunities are, but how we get to engage in the work yes. is really a large question. And I think that, to come full circle, the, the history of women doing this work, you know, at the local level, at the institutional level, at the practice level, at the academic level, is one of the examples that can be paid attention to more than lip service mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I think, and I think that, um, to that point, the, what are the, when I think about what are the things that are going to um, continue to amplify the work of those women and provide space for them, um, it includes uh, some of this narrative shifting that needs to happen, and that's what I think like um, folks that I've organized with we've been very much trying to push is changing these fields. Like, I don't want to practice traditional planning because it's been used to, um, you know, take resources from and also like basically contain folks that look like me. 
that's what original planners were doing of designing, okay, let's put them right there and we let them go to work and then go back, you know, and we're not gonna provide any resources to their neighborhoods um, and their livelihood. And so I don't wanna do that planning, but I do know that there has been black-led um, planning since the beginning of time, because we, um, I just think about even though I'm a descendant of slaves from North Carolina, or people that were enslaved in North Carolina. And when we got free, folks started building Freedmen's Colonies. My grandmother's a descendant of that, I'm a descendant of that in Manteo, North Carolina, and I started doing research there. And it's so interesting to know what were the first buildings that they built, right? Because that's, there's our planning and design decisions that those folks are making that do not get taught at school, like when you're, once you're in planning school. And so challenging that and starting to offer some of this regroundings, like these kickoff meetings, like, um, in my black space work, we start all of our projects with groundings because we've decided that we don't want to do a kickoff. It's too, like, it doesn't make sense. Like, um, when we hear the word, it's um, we're jumping into something for no reason when really we want to ground ourselves. We want to ground ourselves as partners with our co-designers. We want to ground ourselves in the actual space and the stories behind it so that we can stay in details and stay in nuance. We have spaces of reflection, and so I think more people deciding to um, take, make that narrative shift, make those different practice shifts, and then funders being able to also stay on the ground and aware of those is really important so that you can get resources to all of these um, folks that are doing amazing work. Museum Q has now mapped it for you, right? Like, there are um, so many people doing work. How do you get funding to them? It's less about, and I think this is where a lot of, like, at least nonprofit focused, um, and what that's where a lot of arts and cultural spaces are, um, in the nonprofit world, you find yourself having to shift to the language of the funds. And I think that more and more we need to put pressure on um, funders to shift their language to be reflective of the work we're doing, because another piece, we're wrapping, but another piece that um, we talked about was, like, we, I don't, would Joan have called herself a preservationist? Like, you know, where we were. Actually, she would. She would, okay, okay. <laughs> so she would, on that record. But there's a lot of folks that we work with that we talked about that do not use these terms. And so questioning these terms also is like a piece of it and getting, you know, Malcolm X talks about making things plain. I think that's something that um, all of our fields could do. And with that, we're gonna drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.